So in this video, we're gonna go into a little bit more detail about how ATP works, and we're gonna see that it can turn into a molecule called ADP, which is closely related. So um, let's go uh, see a little bit more about the structure of ATP. Uh, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. I'm really not too concerned about memorizing that because we're always just gonna use the acronym ATP. But just in brief, the most uh, important part about the, Foley, uh, the full term is the triphosphate part because tri stands for three. And that means that there are really three phosphates attached to the molecule. And that's gonna be the functional part. That's gonna be the part that really does the job of the ATP. Um, very briefly, I just wanna say that I'm gonna try and use the, just the letter P to represent an entire phosphate. It can be a little confusing because we often use the word P, uh, letter P to also represent the phosphorus atom. Um, so this is a phosphorus atom, but as it turns out, a whole phosphate is like a P with four oxygen atoms around it. Definitely don't need to know that for this course, and I'm not even that concerned if you kind of confuse uh, phosphorus with phosphate groups. Um, but just uh, I figure I would point that out briefly. So I'm going to get rid of this kind of atomic model down here because we don't need to worry about that. And I'm fine if you just want to rep represent phosphates as P's. So we have three phosphates attached to the adenosine. As it turns out, the adenosine is an adenine nitrogen base combined with the sugar that it is usually attached to in nucleic acids. So um, I'm not worried about adenosine at all. That's not the functional part of the molecule. But um, I do want you to think of ATP as being like a fully charged battery. Um, it is ready to go with three phosphates attached. It's ready to deliver energy to molecules that need it. So let's talk about that. I kind of did that briefly in the last video, in the nucleic acid video. Um, but essentially when an ATP molecule um, energizes another molecule like a protein, it transfers a phosphate to it. So it actually cuts a phosphate off of itself and gives that phosphate to the, say, protein. Sometimes um, other chemicals are, are, are given a phosphate in cells as well. Um, but for our purposes, when a protein or a chemical is given a phosphate, maybe it's able to do the, the job that it was supposed to do or the chemical reaction that it was supposed to undergo um, that maybe it wasn't able to do beforehand. As it turns out, not all chemicals need to be given a phosphate, but, but some of them do. And uh, the other thing I want you to know is that when a protein or a chemical undergoes the process that it's supposed to go uh, through now that it's been given a phosphate, the phosphate falls off after it is finished. In other words, we're gonna need billions of molecules of ATP in cells because proteins and chemicals in chemistry always goes on in an active living cell. So um, if proteins are constantly getting a phosphate, but then they fall off as soon as they do the job once, in order to make sure that they do the job constantly, we're gonna need lots of ATPs to give them phosphates again. Okay, so let's think about if, uh, if the phosphate fell off of any given um, ATP molecule, um, what's left over? Well, we certainly have that phosphate still, and we have this leftover part that we're gonna call ADP, or adenosine diphosphate, di meaning two, because there are two phosphates left on the molecule. And for our purposes, I want you to think of that as like a half-charged battery. Um, there are only two phosphates on there. As it turns out, we really could, cells can um, uh, transfer the second phosphate to a protein as well, um, but it does not give the protein as much energy and, and any healthy cell will normally be, just be going between ATP and ADP. Um, so most cells are gonna wanna recharge the molecule by reattaching the phosphate. Well, as it turns out, that takes energy because cutting it off released energy and so reattaching it is gonna require energy. So um, you can kind of liken this to using your phone. Um, um, using the functions of your phone spends energy from your battery. And then in order to recharge your battery power, you maybe need to um, introduce some electrical energy by plugging it into an outlet of some kind. So that electrical energy is gonna be kind of converted back into chemical storage energy so you can use your phone again. Well, as it turns out, we have a very similar process, but we certainly do not plug ourselves into an outlet to recharge ourselves. We're using the energy stored within food calories or the energy stored within sugars and fats. And when we cut them up through the process of cellular respiration, which we'll also have a video about, 
um, that process releases energy needed to push ADP and P back together. So let me just kind of show you that. So if, the, um, if you cut up, say, a sugar and you release the energy stored within the sugar, that energy can be used to push these guys back together. And now we've got the fully charged ATP back again. Okay, so just to kind of summarize everything, we're really focused on the ATP molecule and the ADP that it can become when ATP spends energy by transferring one of its three phosphates to something like a protein so that that protein can do its job. When that happens, and after the protein finishes, the phosphate falls off again, and we're left with ADP, a two-phosphate molecule, and we'd like to reattach that phosphate. Well, that can be done by, again, cutting up food energy, and, and the energy that's released from doing that recharges the ATP by putting the two together again. My final comment would be to re remind you of the, the, this, uh, kind of reviewing this reviews the very broad concepts of matter cycles and energy flow. Um, notice that the matter can be recycled. Um, that, that the phosphates and the molecules itself can constantly go back and forth, but that energy flows in one direction. In order to make this process happen, we need the energy stored within food to help uh, 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 recharge the molecule. Um, and that, that's a one direction uh, process, uh, that energy is only flowing in one direction. And anytime you spend energy, you're also releasing heat. So that typically um, when you're using lots of ATP, like when you're contracting your muscles a lot when you run on a treadmill, that's why you're releasing so much heat.